All right, biology students, today we are talking about enzymes. So if you'll remember back in our macromolecules lesson, we discussed proteins. Um, we talked about what they are, what they do, what their structure looks like. Um, and today we're going to focus our attention on a specific protein known as an enzyme. Now, of all the proteins that we could discuss, why are we focusing on enzymes? Um, well, because enzymes catalyze biochemical reactions that are essential for living organisms. We're going to talk about lots of those biochemical reactions this year. Um, and so it's very important that we discuss enzymes and their role in those biochemical reactions up front at the beginning of biology. So it's important to know that in nature, some chemical reactions that are vital for survival happen either too slowly or they just don't happen at all. So enzymes, what they do is they allow these reactions to occur in the body that would otherwise be impossible. So enzymes are very essential to living organisms. So what are enzymes? Um, enzymes are proteins, we've mentioned that, and their job is to speed up chemical reactions. Uh, now, I'm not sure how much background you have in chemistry. I don't know if you've had a chemistry course before or in physical science, if you remember chemical reactions um, from the chemistry portion of physical science. But just a refresher, a chemical reaction takes place when reactants come together and they yield what we call products. And those products become brand new substances they have a completely different molecular structure. So already this year, when we talked about macromolecules, we've talked about two chemical processes, hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis. If you don't remember those, go back to our macromolecules lesson and do a refresher over those because that lesson talks about these two chemical processes. Um, chemical reactions require energy. That's important for you to know. Now, in the biological processes that we're going to discuss today, these reactions are going to require energy that we're going to give a special name to. We're going to call this energy activation energy or just the energy needed to start a chemical reaction. It's like giving it a kick in the butt. So let's see what it looks like on a graph because this is going to be pretty important. Uh, graphs that look like this, what you see on your screen, um, are going to be on your quizzes and tests and then your final year exam. So I just want to go ahead and show you what um, activation energy looks like on a graph. Um, so you can see activation energy, first of all, let me back up. In a chemical reaction, all chemical reactions require energy. So you can see here um, that activation energy is required to kickstart the chemical reaction and then once the chemical reaction gets going it's like a ball rolling down a hill it requires no more energy um, so you have what's called reactants and you have what's called products in a chemical reaction again reactants are the things that come together to yield you products very similar to like a math equation when you add two things together and you get a sum um, in a chemical reaction, you can mix some things together and you can get products. Products have a different molecular structure than reactants. And when you mix these reactants together, or you join these reactants together, that chemical reaction requires energy initially, which we're calling activation energy. And then once the chemical reaction gets started, no energy, no further activation energy is needed. All right, so let's talk just a little bit about chemistry. Again, I just mentioned the difference between reactants and products, so make sure that you get this in your notes. Again, reactants are the substances that are changed during a chemical reaction, or in our case, this is what goes into the process. Uh, now, specifically with enzymes, the reactant is going to be known as the substrate. This is pretty confusing if you take like a chemistry class and then you take a biology class or you take physical science and then you take biology um, because in chemistry we call reactants reactants, but in biology we refer to them as the substrate. I know, very confusing, but by the end of the lesson you'll, you'll get it. Um, you also have products, which again are like the substances that are made or created by the chemical reactions, what comes out of the process. Now, without getting too far into chemistry, hopefully this is just a review. 
you have four different options for chemical reactions. So if you look here, sometimes we can take two reactants or a few reactants, mix them together and get one product. Um, this is called a synthesis reaction. You can also have the opposite occur where you have one reactant that's going to yield two products. So it's like this, um, the reactants are going to be busted up into different products. This is called a decomposition reaction. Now you also can have it where your products have one molecular change made. Uh, and this is called a single replacement reaction. And then if you have a situation where you have products with two molecular changes made, we call this a double replacement reaction. Now, if I just blew your mind with that, no worries. I just, we've got to have some basic chemistry knowledge. Um, so I wanted to just kind of share this with you or remind you of this, um, but we're not going to focus on it too much because I've got some specific enzymes related information to give you. All right, so why on earth are we spending the time to talk about enzymes? Enzymes are going to be something that comes up periodically throughout the year in all of our units. So uh, in unit three, we're going to discuss cellular respiration and photosynthesis. This is our energetics unit. Um, we're going to hear about enzymes in, in those processes. Then in unit four, when we get to genetics, we're going to talk about enzymes and their role in DNA replication and protein synthesis. Uh, so many, many, many examples of enzymes and how they are essential to these biological processes that occur for us as humans. All right, so make sure that you get this information in your notes. Um, since organisms depend on these chemical reactions to survive, it is essential that reactions occur quickly. We don't have years and weeks and months for these chemical reactions that are essential to life to happen. So enzymes are needed. Enzymes are catalysts, which just means they speed up chemical reactions. And they do this by reducing the activation energy required to start the reaction. We saw that a little bit of, um, a few slides ago on the activation energy graph. I'll show you another uh, graph in just a little bit so this makes more sense. But very important, if you don't copy down anything else in your notes, make sure you get down this point. Enzymes are catalysts. They speed up chemical reactions. How did they do that? They do that by reducing the activation energy or the energy needed to start the reaction. It's also important to note that enzymes are not changed or used up in the process. Um, so when they are used, uh, when they catalyze, they're not, um, what am I trying to say? <laughs> enzymes aren't changed or used up in the reactions that they catalyze. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so they can be used to speed up the same reaction over and over and over again. Sorry, I got tongue tied there. All right, so this process of a chemical reaction occurring with an enzyme is very procedural. Um, it is a step-by-step -step process. So what happens first is the reactant, which we are calling a substrate, is going to bind to a special part of the enzyme called an active site. So let me hop over one slide so you can see what this looks like. All right, so you can see here you have an enzyme. You have this part called an active site. And the substrates are going to bind to the active site. Okay, that's step one. Then what's going to happen is the chemical reaction is going to take place. So it got the activation energy it needs. Chemical reaction starts. The reaction is taking place. Now, a couple things can be happen here. Bonds can be being made or they could be breaking. Um, so you have some different options. But regardless this is what it looks like. So the enzyme is actually going to facilitate that chemical reaction. At this point, we have sort of a lock and key system. Uh, the substrate is locked into the enzyme. We call this an enzyme substrate complex. So this, this actually has a name. And then what's happening is the product is going to be released from the enzyme enzyme, remember, remains unchanged. It's going to go on to do more chemical reactions, um, and the product is going to be used uh, by the organism or the cell for whatever process it 
needs it for. Um, so you can see here, you have the enzyme, it's going to release those products, and the enzyme is going to move on to bigger and better things. Um, here's how it looks on a graph. So I do want to, um, to show you that. So an enzyme and a substrate are going to come together. Now, I want you to see here um, with no catalyst. So if you, were, if you didn't have an enzyme, the activation energy needed to start the chemical reaction would be much higher. Now, when I add the enzyme, so this is with the enzyme, notice the activation energy is much lower. So that is exactly how an enzyme works. It lowers the activation energy needed to kickstart a chemical reaction. So you can see we have a lower activation energy, and then after the chemical reaction happens, the enzyme and the product uh, release from one another, and then the enzyme goes on to uh, kickstart more chemical reactions. Here is another example of what it looks like on a graph without the cartoon images. This is more likely what you'll see on quizzes and tests and then our end of the year exam. Um, so again, you have energy. Energy is needed regardless. Whether you have an enzyme or not, energy is needed. Activation energy is needed. However, with an enzyme, the activation energy is much lower. And you can see that in the, in the graph. You have your reactants here, you have your products here, and this is just a comparison. All right, let's talk just a second about enzymes, their form, which we've mentioned a little bit, and their function. So enzymes have a very, very specific shape. Um, and that shape is oftentimes referred to as like a lock and key system. So I want to go back just a minute. Um, okay, so you can see here, you have like the lock and you have the key. And a specific enzyme is conditioned or shaped perfectly for specific substrates. Uh, there's tons of different examples of enzymes. Uh, we have lots of like digestive system enzymes like lipase, which breaks down lipids into glycerol and fatty acids. Um, you can have protease, which um, breaks down proteins in their individual amino acids. You can also have pepsin, which is produced in the stomach. It is an enzyme that also breaks down proteins uh, into d individual amino acids. So enzymes are very specific to uh, what they do and how they bind with unique substrates. Now, what happens if the form is not just right. Well, then the function suffers. So enzymes, an enzyme shape is essential to its function. And if it doesn't have the perfect shape, it can't do its job. So just like any old key will not fit in any old lock, any old enzyme won't bond with any old substrate. Um, the conditions have to be what we call optimal. So by optimal, we just mean that enzymes have to have an optimal pH, an optimal temperature that they work best in. And if those conditions aren't met, um, the enzyme can do what we call denature. So if you have a pH that's too high or too low, um, the enzyme will denature, which just means the enzyme will lose its shape and it will no longer work. So let's see what that looks like on a graph. Um, so let's talk temperature first. Right, so you can see from this graph for this particular enzyme, um, the enzyme has an optimal temperature of 40 degrees Celsius, which means it does its best job at 40 degrees Celsius. Anything lower than that or anything higher than that might cause the enzyme to denature, which means it's going to lose its shape and it's not going to be effective. Now, will this enzyme work in a temperature of 39 degrees Celsius or 41 degrees Celsius? Yeah, maybe, um, but it's not going to be op optimal. Optimal um, means that it's going to work best at 40 degrees. The same thing happens with pH levels. So we want optimal pH levels for this particular enzyme in this particular graph. Um, a pH of 7 is optimal. Uh, anything less or anything higher might cause the enzyme to denature. 
Now let's also talk about inhibitors. Um, so inhibitors can bind to an enzyme and actually block or prevent the substrate from properly binding. Now this sounds like it would only be like a negative thing, and it certainly is sometimes. So sometimes inhibitors are harmful, um, like with the case of cyanide. So cyanide's a poison, uh, but it is an inhibitor that blocks ATP or energy production through aerobic respiration. So if you ingest cyanide or you're poisoned with cyanide, um, it is an inhibitor that blocks essential functions for survival. So ultimately you die. Uh, there are examples of inhibitors that are help, helpful. A lot of uh, medicines are inhibitors that help with uh, survival. So there's some cases where the body's chemical functions will make the heart pump harder. So a doctor might prescribe an inhibitor that helps slow down those chemical reactions so that the um, blood pressure doesn't increase and the heart doesn't have to work as hard. Now, we covered a lot of information. Feel free to go back and get anything that you missed. Um, there is a great YouTube video if you need more examples on enzymes and how they work. Um, if you will just type in biology enzymes into YouTube, there's a video that you can watch that helps just explain the process and it provides you with some animations. Um, and I will see you in the next lesson.